establishing the requirements for the Enhancing Community Preparedness and Resilience National Priority Area, and additional guidance on how to submit a strong application for the HSGP. We hope that this webinar will provide clearer guidance on how to navigate the new grant program requirements. Additionally, and perhaps most importantly, we will have time at the end of today's webinar for Q&A. For further support, and I can't stress this enough, we recommend you work with your state administrative agency and or your urban area working group affiliated with the urban area with the UAC grants. Now, Ginny, let me turn it over to you for the next slide, please. All right, good morning, everybody, and thank you, Erin. Um, as Erin said, my name is Ginny Warren, and I am the Deputy Director for the Preparedness Grants Division at FEMA. And as Erin mentioned, we did release the notices of funding opportunity for eight preparedness grant programs uh, a couple weeks ago. Uh, so here on this slide, it, it highlights um, those areas of funding. Uh, but really, we're going to focus on um, the first three pro the first couple of programs there, the State Homeland Security Program and the Urban Area Security Initiative. Um, really, what these programs are all about is enhancing the ability of state and local governments, as well as nonprofit organizations, to prevent, prepare for, protect against, and respond to potential acts of terrorism. Um, and that is an important note, is that these funds uh, were authorized in the wake of 9-11. And so any funding, any projects that are used with this funding must be related to um, terrorism security. Now, we realize there are a lot of dual uses of funds, and something that can be used uh, for terrorism will also have a dual benefit of general public safety and things of that nature. But that is an important distinction I wanted to make up front, is that any projects that are funded with these grant funds do have to have a nexus to terrorism security. Uh, as you can see this year, there was almost uh, $1.6 billion um, appropriated under these programs, which we are always very thankful for. Um, as you can see, just between the, the State Homeland Security Program and the Urban Area Security Initiative, that right there was open, uh, over a billion dollars. Um, so one of the other things I, I want to emphasize before we move to the next slide um, is that for the State Homeland Security Program and Urban Area Security Initiative, those allocations have already been announced. Those are formula-based allocations. And so every state and territory and urban area already knows the amount of funding that they are going to receive this year. However, they still have to develop applications and investments and projects to um, justify the amount of funding that they will receive. And so that's kind of what we're here to discuss today, um, is that there are some set minimum spending requirements that they have under these programs. And part of our job here is to, to help you figure out um, some, some effective ways to, to use that funding under the State Homeland Security Program and Urban Area Security Initiative. Um, so all of their funding allocations were already published in the notice of funding opportunity that was released on May 13th. Um, and as Aaron mentioned, uh, the state administrative agency is who you need to be working with. They are technically the only eligible applicant. And everybody who gets funded under them is a sub-applicant and a sub-recipient. So if you don't know who you're State Administrative Agency Point of Contact is. We have um, provided a link for uh, how to find that and suggest you get working with them as soon as possible because um, even if it's not, uh, might be a little too late this year, depending on each state's requirements and timelines, uh, we fully anticipate this to be an area of focus in future years and it's never too, too late to start planning for the future. All right, next slide, please. All right, so a couple of the programmatic enhancements focusing on the State Homeland Security Program and Urban Area Security Initiative. Um, there are six national priority areas under this program. And basically what that means is every year uh, DHS evaluates the evolving threat landscape. And we take a look at evaluating the national risk profile, and we see how risks have changed, if there's certain levels of vulnerability across the nation, and then we set priorities that help ensure the appropriate allocation of those security dollars against those for those resources and priorities. And so this year, DHS Secretary Mayorkas um, identified six national priority areas based on the current threat landscape and after consultation with um, some security experts and, of course, preparedness grant stakeholders. And so the, the biggest thing to highlight here is that one of the new areas that he added was enhancing community preparedness and resilience. And you'll see there that there is a 3% minimum spend. And what that means is that every state, territory, and urban area has to spend at least 3% of their SHISHIP or UAS allocation on community preparedness and resilience. And that's a minimum. They can certainly spend more. 
And as a matter of fact, um, every recipient has to spend at least 30% of their allocations on these six areas. Only 12% is dictated in minimum spends, which means that they have a flexibility of where 18% of that funding goes across those six areas. So we're hoping that um, the states and territories and urban areas will, in fact, spend more than the 3% minimum spend on that area. Um, and so that's part of you know, what we're here to talk to you today about, is to, to get some of those project ideas and get working with your, your state administrative agencies to submit those project proposals. And finally, uh, the applicants must also allocate at least 30% of their awards to law enforcement terrorist prevention activities. Those can also overlap with the national priority um, areas. And so they're not mutually exclusive, that 30% can be the same as a lot of, obviously, projects that benefit law enforcement uh, prevention, uh, terror prevention activities will also be associated with the national priority areas. Now, there is one more thing that I wanted to add, and that is that each state and territory is required to subaward at least 80% of the funding that they receive to uh, local units of government. And so while they can retain 20% of the award, they are required to pass through 80%. And so that's where um, all of this and you all come in, uh, that you could be eligible subrecipients for that 80% of funding that they're required to, to pass through. Next slide, please. All right, thanks, Judy. I'm going to take it back over from here for a little bit. So folks, bottom line up front. When we talk about resilience, what we're talking about is an individual's ability to overcome a challenge, when we think about that term. As you may have seen in the Notice of Funding Opportunity, or NOFO, that was released on May 13, 2022, there are a handful of ways that we recommend that you can meet the Enhancing Community Preparedness and Resilience National Priority Area, or the 3% spending minimum that Judy just outlined. For example, you could establish, train, and maintain community emergency response teams and team CERT teams with a focus on historically underserved communities. This includes the procurement of appropriate tools, equipment, and training aids, local delivery of CERT train the trainer, and CERT program manager to build local program training and maintenance capability. Providing continuity training is another option. We actually have training that, we, that is available for free called the Organizations Preparing for Emergency Needs, or OPEN training. This is designed for faith-based organizations, local businesses, and community-based organizations such as homeless shelters, food pantries, nonprofit medical providers, and senior care facilities to bolster their resilience to all hazards. I'm sure as all of you emergency managers know, these facilities are often the glues of communities during blue sky days. And if we can build them resilience during blue sky days, they're going to be more resilient to gray sky days and events. And that's something we would really encourage all of you to focus on. Our team loves youth preparedness. I can't begin to tell you how passionate we are about this. And I know that a lot of folks out there in the youth are passionate about it as well. So another option for using these funds is to partner with local school districts to deliver the student tools for emergency planning curriculum or other educational programming to guide students in how to create emergency kits and family communications plans. Partner with stakeholders to assist with the completing of the Emergency Financial First Aid Kit, or a similar tool to bolster the disaster-centric financial resilience of individuals and households. We're not talking about trying to promote people to um, have emergency savings accounts. Um, that was a priority for the previous administration. It's not a large focus for FEMA anymore. Um, but what we are encouraging people to do is to get their finances organized in a shape, manner, or form that will allow them to have those materials organized so that will make their disaster recovery easier. And the Emergency Financial First Aid Kit is a great tool to help you do that. Other options are to execute the You Are the Help Until the Help Arrives workshops in concert with some of those community-based organizations I talked about earlier. You could target youth preparedness, again, using FEMA programming such as the Prepare with Pedro resources and the Ready to Help Children's card game. You can promote community planning, coordination, and integration of children's needs during emergencies through workshops like FEMA's Integrating the Needs of Children's Training. You can identify community resources and characteristics to identify gaps in resources, identify hazards and vulnerabilities, and inform action to promote resilience through community mapping or provide training and awareness programs with key stakeholders through social media, community, and civic organizations to educate the public on misinformation and disinformation campaigns to increase individual and community resilience. 
And these are just some of the examples. So folks, I just want to be clear. I want, our goal here was to give you sort of the football field of options where you could sort of operate under to sort of be able to either create programs, build out programs, or really innovate with programs in your, in your respective communities in concert with your state administrative agencies. You can accomplish a lot under this grant when you tie preparedness and resilience to law enforcement terrorism prevention activities. We are putting in the chat box a link to all of the resources and the programs that I just mentioned. Jenny, back to you. All right, thank you, Erin. Uh, on the next slide, we have a very fun, I'm joking, it's, a, it's an awful timeline this year. Um, unfortunately, because appropriations were so late, uh, we're very compressed in the time frame that we are able to allow applicants to apply. So right now, as you see, we had the um, appropriations were passed on March 15th of this year. We released the notices of funding opportunity, which officially opens up the grant application life cycle on Friday, May 13th. So right now, we are in a 31-day application period. All applications are due June 13th at 5 p.m. Eastern Time. That's when the state administrative agencies have to submit all of their preliminary applications to FEMA so that we can award them the funding that they were identified to receive in the notice of funding opportunity. So while that seems very short, and it is, um, the upside is, is that we do not require um, the states and territories to have all project level detail at the time of application. We recognize that it is, is an extremely short application cycle, and so as long as the, the states and territories get the initial um, applications in with a high level um, agreement for how they're going to allocate the money, project level details can come later, and we're working with FEMA, and then we'll release the funding as we get that information. So if you're not able to have everything or you're not able to work out everything with the SAA by June 13th, that's okay. There's still some wiggle room and some time in there um, but as we still make awards and release the funding holds uh, throughout the rest of the year. But again, like I said, sometimes even if it is too late for this fiscal year, there's always looking ahead to next year's grants. And so if you don't have that relationship with your state administrative agency, get working on it now. Um, and so that even if um, we're not able to, to do something for this year, it's a good stepping stone and a good uh, relationship building block for next year. When all the applications are due on June 13th, then we will take all of the, download all the applications and we review. Um, <laughs> that final allocation is announced on August 17th. That's for our competitive program um, where we do a competitive review and award by the project level. As I mentioned earlier, for the State Homeland Security Program and Urban Area Security Initiative, for which we're focusing on today, um, we already know what those final allocations are for the states and territories. So they already know the level of funding that they're um, going to receive and they're working to identify the projects and investments that will support the funding that they will get. And all of this money has to be obligated by the end of the fiscal year. But like I said, that doesn't necessarily mean that every project level detail needs to be figured out by then. We will still award all the funding to the states and territories, but we can place them on hold until that project level detail is is figured out and is identified. And for these projects, once they are submitted to FEMA, uh, we uh, undergo what we call an enhanced effectiveness review. And for the community preparedness and resilience projects, we will rely very heavily with our partners, Aaron's group at ICPD, to review those projects and to make sure that they are in alignment with that national priority area and, of course, um, that they are allowable under the grant program. And like I said before, uh, these grant programs, they do have to have uh, a nexus to terrorism security. And I'm going to be honest, there are some projects that are great ideas that are absolutely beneficial to the community and are great ideas, but unfortunately they're just not a fit under these programs. Um, so don't, you know, take that personally. <laughs> don't take that as to, you know, to say that that's a, uh, you know, something that we don't think it's a, a valuable project, but we are pretty limited and um, somewhat in the types of projects we can fund, noting that alignment to terrorism security. Next slide, please. So we still do have um, some additional uh, technical assistance webinars specific to the Homeland Security Grant Program, as you'll see on this slide. Uh, we still have three more before the application deadline, and that's Wednesday, June 1st, Monday, June 6th, and then Wednesday, June 8th, all at 2 o'clock Eastern time. And there's a lot of information. They're all Zoom meetings. 
And really, we just take these opportunities to answer any general questions that folks have about the Homeland Security Grant Program and about the application uh, process and procedures. Um, and so these are three more opportunities for you if you want to, to listen in and just hear what we have to say, give a brief overview of the program, but also hear some of the other questions that other stakeholders and, and applicants are asking. And of course, uh, if you have any questions about any of our grant programs, including this one, um, always email askcsid at fema.dhs.gov, and we'll make sure that your question is routed to the appropriate subject matter expert for a response. Great. Thanks, Jenny. Let's go to the next slide, please, folks. We're going to bring it on home and open this up for Q&A. So a couple of final key points. I had a little favor to ask all of you, just a small one. Um, I know many of you at this moment probably have a lot of questions on eligible costs. Can, quote, something along the lines of, can I seek or can my municipality seek reimbursement for X, Y, Z cost under this national priority area? At, the, at this phone call in this forum, Ginny nor I are going to be giving a thumbs up or a thumbs to the middle or a thumbs down any of those questions. If you want to put that eligible cost question into the Q&A, into the chat, our team, our wonderful team who's working behind the scenes to make this webinar happen, they're going to take that question and we will root it appropriately because sometimes those questions, you might need to get a lawyer involved, it might take a couple of other subject matter experts that are on my team or Jenny's team. So we, we're going to avoid and we're not going to sort of give thumbs up or thumbs down responses to specific eligible cost questions, but we will take those as get backs and we will get back to you. Secondly, I know Jitty said this, I said this, I'm going to keep driving this home. There needs to be a link to terrorism. Jitty mentioned this before that, it, that it, it's unfortunately, it's a stealth, not unfortunately, the reality is it is a statutory requirement for this grant. That means that Congress would need to change the law for us to alter that, and that's not really in the cards at the moment. So again, um, those technical assistance sessions could even give you all advice about how to make that linkage, which is important. It could be broad, but there needs to be a linkage. And finally, uh, Judy can correct me if I'm wrong here, the primary grantee for this for the HSGP is the state administrative agency. Um, so these funds, so my big recommendation to all of you is I believe sometime in the chat we're going to put a link to where you can find the contact information for all of the state administrative agencies. Great folks for you to reach out to and make contact with. Um, we're now going to have a facilitated question and answer session for the remainder of the webinar. Um, you guys can start to put your Q&As in there. We're going to do our best to answer all of them. If we can't, we're going to take them for a get back. Um, and why don't we go ahead and get started. So folks, just bear with us as we start to do this. Um, so let's see. Question, let me, let me take a look at the chat. Um, how does a town request for this grant program from Nyapadal Fongpreda? Nyapadal, I'm sorry if I butchered your name. So, Jenny, I think in this case, their principal point of contact, would it be their local emergency manager, or should they go right to the state administrative agency? I would recommend going right to the state administrative agency because, as we said, they are the only eligible applicant, so any project requests and sub-applications would have to be submitted to the SAA, and the SAA would package all that up in their application to FEMA. Great. Thank you. And I assume out of Rachel or Joseph could jump in, are we going to drop the link to the SAA on the web page into the chat? I'll take that as a yes. Okay. Another question. Does the project need to benefit the entire county or community? Our project will focus on mitigating flood risk for our educational facility. Um, Jenny, what do you think? I don't think it necessarily has to benefit the entire community or the county, but there needs to be a terrorism linkage. I think that's really the key point for this second question. Correct. Um, it does not need to benefit an entire county or community. And I mean, a lot of these are you know, very focused on individual spaces, facilities, and things of that nature. Um, so, and, but to, to Aaron's point, um, you know, mitigating flood risk, uh, it would still have to somehow tie back to how would a terrorist event cause that flood. Um, you know, that, that's just a limitation of the, the authorizing statute for the grant program. Great. Thanks, Jenny. So another question, and um, I love this question. It's from Ricardo Medina. So Ricardo, I'm going to give you a shout out because this was the question. I think we set up these webinars specifically so we could answer questions such as this one. Could an NGO apply for this grant? Our organization focus on providing certain trade to the Hispanic community in the states we have a presence. So Ricardo, 
the key thing for you here, and Jenny, I want you to have my, I do always have my back, Jenny, but I'm sure you'll clarify, <laughs> is the state administrative agencies, Joseph Dickey, my colleague, plopped it in the chat. I know we keep coming back to this. Those are the folks you need to make contact with. So, Ricardo, if I'm you, this is what I'm doing. I'm reaching out to every single state administrative agency that you have a presence in, and you are offering your, your organization services, support, and capabilities to help the SAA and the subgrantees develop CERT training in Hispanic communities. Because, Ricardo, I will tell you right there, developing CERT training in um, communities where English is a second language, that is a special priority for the Deputy Administrator for Resilience and the Administrator, uh, Administrator Criswell and the Secretary. Judy, I, I think I kept that sort of in balance. Are you tracking on that? Anything else you want to clarify in that response to Ricardo? Yeah, that was great. The only thing I would clarify is that technically the NGO would not uh, likely yes. be an eligible sub-applicant to the SAA, but like Aaron said, if you contact with the SAA, if that's a project the state might want to take on statewide, and then, you know, they could obviously, it wouldn't be a, a sub-grant to you, but it would be a contract. Um, right. And so that would be that, would be that angle there. Mm -hmm. So technically, Judy, in a case like Ricardo's, in theory, you've seen this happen in other national priority areas, Ricardo's organization could, in theory, under this grant, you know, the, the, the SAA could contract with Ricardo's organization to, for him to, for his organization to provide those services, right. and, and that the SAA could seek reimbursement under this grant. Is that correct? Capture that correct. correctly? Okay, yep. great. All right. Um, question four from Camelia Joseph. What are what are eligible costs? Uh, my Ms. Tom, Jenny, Ms. Warren, why don't you take this one? Give us give us an example. I mean, at a broad level, I mean, eligible costs are you know pretty pretty broadly focused and you know around planning, organization, um, equipment, training, and exercises. Those are kind of the five broad high level categories. As to specific allowable costs, I mean. Pretty much, as, I don't want to say that as long as there is that nexus to terrorism, the, the eligible costs are pretty broad in what you can or can't do. Um, I would recommend reading the Notice of Funding Opportunity and the Preparedness Grants Manual that go into to some additional detail and provide some project examples. But in terms of, of cost allowability, it is pretty broad as to, to what are allowable, um, including personnel costs, paying for staff, and paying for overtime, and things like that. It, it, even that's included. So it, it is, it's, I mean, I could give some feedback if there was a specific cost or specific project. We could, you know, take that offline and, and discuss that. But in terms of overall broad categories of cost allowability, it, it is pretty broad and pretty high level um, for allowability under the program. Okay. Thanks, Judy. So, folks, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to jump in, and I see a question here from Amanda Avard, Ms. Avard. I promise I'm not picking on you, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read this one out loud. Are incident command vehicles eligible under this national priority area? It could easily be tied to terrorism and justified for community resilience and preparedness. So, Amanda, if we were at a conference right now, I'd be getting down on my knees and I'd be begging you, and this is I would beg everybody else. Folks, please, what we're trying to do under this national priority area is build community resilience, okay? We're looking to build CERT teams, build youth preparedness programs, make individuals more resilient to disasters, teach you are the help until the help arrives, teach stop the bleed training. There are, and you me if I'm wrong, various other funding streams that you could find funding to buy vehicles and buy equipment for the EOC um, and things along those lines. So the one thing that we would strongly encourage all of you to do I know this, some of this area is probably new to some of you, is please take a step back from the buying of stuff um, when you think about how to use this national priority area. Granted, there are will be eligible, there are there will be certain stuff that we'll review which are eligible costs, such as if you are going to be setting up a CERT team in a historically underserved community. You need to buy equipment for that CERT team. You gotta buy a trainer for that CERT team. We will look favorably, obviously, upon those costs. Those are clearly eligible because they're linked to a specific training. But on a broader scheme, I would respectfully encourage all of you as much as I can to step back a little bit from the buying of equipment, you know, that's very sort of EOC, local EM focused. Jenny, any strong disagreement there? I think I'm in balance, but please correct me if I'm wrong. No, I mean, I agree. I mean, but the, to, to strictly answer the question, yes, that type of, of vehicle would be an allowable cost. But to Aaron's point, 
you know, really just because it's an allowable cost, is that really the, the best way to align under the community preparedness and resilience priority area? Um, so I, had, I had to at least answer the, the bottom line up front question. <laughs> ah, thanks for nothing, Jenny, but I appreciate your transparency. <laughs> and I'm sure, I'm sure if Ms. Avard finds me at a conference, she's going to hunt me down. That's okay. <laughs> um, uh, another question here from Irene Tobias. Are housing departments at higher education at institutions as we serve, as we serve resident community eligible for these type of funds? Um, so, Jenny, I think the bottom line up front question is no, not as a direct grantee, but, parentheses, what I would encourage you all to do, again, reach out to that state administrative agency. So again, for Ms. Tobias, for Irene, good morning. Um, let me give you an example of how, from where I said, and Ginny can always course correct if need be, how I, I would see this happening. If at your, um, your housing department, your higher education institute, if you were looking to, let's say, um, build out a community emergency response team, if you were looking to sort of teach your, if it's higher education, I'm going to go ahead, your, uh, your, 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 uh, oh, your sort of resident advisors, the folks who live with the, with the freshmen, the older students, if you want to teach them first aid, teach them stop the bleed, teach them you are the help until the help arrives training, you could, either working with your local emergency manager or with the state administrative agency, work in a collaborative fashion to work through them um, so they could fund those activities in your higher education institution. Is that fair, Jenny, or you want to course correct me? No, that's fair. I just want to also point out, you know, it really depends on the type of higher education because if it is kind of a nonprofit organization, higher higher education, uh, they would not be eligible as a sub-applicant under this program. Um, they would be under, eligible certainly under the nonprofit security grant program. But if it's a higher education institution, kind of like a, a state associated with the, the state or local unit of government, um, so it, it's a nuanced response. It really depends on the flavor of what the, the type of higher education institution is. Um, what you want to do certainly sounds like it would be allowable, but it would just be the question of um, which grant program to go under and or whether it would be kind of a contract or a sub-grant relationship with the SAA. Okay, great. Thank you. Appreciate that. Um, next question. From uh, Donald Taylor, which links would best benefit small police departments with limited resources? Uh, Jenny, any thoughts on that one? I know there are several law enforcement grants out there, so I want to kind of defer to you here if, um, if we have a, an official from law enforcement who's looking for more information about different funding streams. Over. Um, so for the links, I mean, in terms of the, the grant programs that would best benefit uh, small police departments, certainly, definitely the State Homeland Security Program and the Urban Area Security Initiative. A lot of the funding does go, to, um, is subgranted by the FAA to police departments. Um, so it would definitely um, pursue the Shishup and Uwasi grant programs for your avenue. That actually is probably uh, your best bet, quite honestly, for the suite of preparedness grant programs uh, would be the Shishup and Uwasi programs that we're discussing here today. Okay, great. Let's take a quick pause, folks, um, taking a glass of water. Okay, um, let me go to, where are we? Okay, uh, Terry Corzon, we were looking to purchase an emergency backup generator for our municipal wastewater treatment plant to enhance our resilience in the case of a terrorist attack that takes out the power grid. Is this the type of project, something we could get grant monies for to fund this project? Um, I know, Ginny, under this NPA, what do you think? Trying to say, I actually don't see. I'm trying to read where that was in the chat. I don't see where it is because I want to read that. Can you read that again out loud so I can hear it again? Sure. Um, we are looking to purchase an emergency backup generator for our municipal wastewater treatment plant to enhance our resilience in case of a terrorist attack that takes out the power grid. Is this type of project something that we could get grant monies to fund? I mean, I'll go back to, as long as you make that link to terrorism, um, it would be allowable. But, you know, I don't want to go on record as saying definitely allowable, definitely not, because, like I right. said, unfortunately, well, these are nuanced. But at the higher level, those types of costs are allowable. But, again, it goes back to the, the tying it back to the, the terrorism nexus. Okay. Thank you, man. Okay. Jenny, I'll be, hopefully an easy one for us. Is there a, is there a non-federal match for the HSGP from Ms. Amanda Knight? Great question, and no, there is not. No, mm, no, no match requirement at all. <laughs> Great, yeah. See, I knew that much, Jenny, but I wanted to defer to you on that one. <laughs> um, all right, folks, question from Keith Mohammed. This is an excellent question. What is the relationship, if any, 
between the HSGP grant and the nonprofit security grant. Um, uh, nonprofit security grant. So, Jenny, I know they're all part of the preparedness grant family, as we refer to them as lay people. But why don't I hand that one over to you? Sure. Um, the relationship is. I mean, there's it's uh, different eligible subrecipients for different entities. So, for the Homeland Security Grant Program, um, the eligible kind of recipient subrecipients are you know state and local units of government. Um, and so for the nonprofit security grant program, as the name states, the only eligible subrecipients are nonprofit organizations. The nonprofit organizations are not eligible under HSGP, and state and local units of government are not eligible under NSGP. Uh, the NSGP is also, I would say, more narrowly focused in a sense in its mission and its purpose. Obviously, it's uh, you know, mostly for physical hardening of nonprofit organizations, uh, um, buildings, and infrastructure. It also includes uh, if they uh, for contracted patrols for uh, you know for law enforcement contract patrols, um, but really so they they are you know kind of all interrelated because it's all related obviously to to terrorism security. But the short answer is only nonprofits are eligible under NSGP. Only state and local units government are eligible under HSGP. Got it. Thank you, Mr. Muhammad. I hope that answers the question. Um, Next question from Robert. Oh, Robert, bear with me, man. Uh, Chekluski, Robert, if I, if, you, if I run into you at a conference sometime and I butchered that word, I owe you a beer or a cup of coffee, or you're asking that, Robert Chelowski, um, are medical reserve corps eligible for funding as long as they tie back to the terrorism nexus? That's an interesting question. Any, any thoughts on that, Jenny? Yeah, I guess it would be for what type of activities or services or, you know, it gets down to what would they be requesting for? Is it for their actual service? Is it for equipment? Is it for vehicle? I mean, so it would come down to um, where they actually requesting the funds for. Gotcha. Okay. Um, I'm going to jump around a little bit because I'm going to take a pause. Um, I am uh, born in New Jersey. Um, a native of upstate New York, um, have a lot of friends up in Buffalo, and I think everybody on this phone call, um, I hope, was saddened and angry about what happened in Buffalo um, recently. So Mark Orenschowski, Mark, um, we've been thinking about you. Don't know you personally, but we've been thinking about the whole Homeland Security and Emergency Management team up in Buffalo. I'm going to jump to your question. We suffered a mass shooting last week in Buffalo. Social media played a large role in this event. Could we use funding to contract personnel to monitor social media platforms for terrorist posts? Um, Jenny, I'm going to defer to you on that one. Let's maybe, Jenny, let's think about this broadly. You well, yeah, so I would say maybe not under the, I mean, it wouldn't align that maybe under the Community Preparedness and Resilience National Priority Area, but the Combating Domestic Violent Extremism, um, one of the, the you know, the areas for that, that DVE national priority area is to kind of monitor social media, looking for trends, looking for posts, and basically trying to, to stop incidents before they occur. Um, so at a high level, yes, that, that type of thing would be um, allowable, probably more aligned with the combating domestic violence and extremism, national priority area, but, but yes. Okay. Mark, um, you, given what your community is going through, I imagine you were probably in no mood for good idea fairies, but I'm going to, I'm going to, Take a moment of uh, from one upstate New York guy to another. Something to think about, Mark. Um, you know, you might. Uh, Craig Fugate, our former administrator, used to say this thing that in the aftermath of an event, no matter what it is, you know, chances are as you well know it's going to be your neighbor or the person standing next to you in the checkout counter who's going to save your life. So, Mark, one thing for you all to think about, um, especially because I would assume you have a community right now that is galvanized to take steps to help their fellow community members is what you could do under this national priority area is stop the lead training or you are the help until the help arrives training to really equip your fellow citizens with some basic skills so they can help save a life uh, in the God forbid event that something like this were to occur again in your community. Uh, Mark, hope you had, we hope you answered your question and know that we are standing by to support our brothers and sisters in Buffalo in any way possible. Um, moving on, question from John Pantry. Can funds be acquired for private community developments that sponsor and teach emergency planning for any threat? Um, so, Jenny, I'm going to take a pause here. I think we're getting, you know, Jenny, this is one of the reasons we wanted to have this webinar, actually, John, was questions from you. And, Jenny, I want to make sure that you and I are speaking with one voice. Folks, as you can tell, it's mine and Jenny's first webinar out of a series of three. So, so Jenny, you know, 
these are our stakeholders, Jenny. You know, these are our these local community organizations. So you're John, you're John Pantry. You want to teach emergency planning to your community, right? Or you want to start a cert team. But you're just a guy running a community organization. You know, is is John's first step really to pick up the phone, to pick up the email, rather reach out to that state administrative agency and say, hey, I've seen this national priority area. FEMA just briefed me. I have a community that I want to make more secure, or I want to trade in resilience. Um, how can I help? Is that how can we work together? Would that be your recommendation for John, as well as other sort of community-based organization leaders who are on this phone call? Sorry to put you on the spot, Jenny, but I'm picking up a common theme with some of these questions from that part of the community. I'm sure I'm sure you understand. No, absolutely. I mean, so the, what jumped out at me about this question was, you know, private community development. And so, I, I mean, obviously, private entities are not again, eligible sub-applicant sub-recipients, but again, going back to that contract um, availability. And so, yes, either reaching out directly to the SAA or if there is a community, um, you know, state, local, unit of government in your community that you specifically want to, to help focus on, you could also reach out to them and then go with them to the SAA, and that might make an even stronger case, saying, hey, not only do I have this service I want to provide, I already have this, um, this entity that's eligible to you as a sub-applicant that's interested, and then the SAA could sub-award to that entity who would then enter into the contract um, to teach the emergency planning. Okay, wonderful. Sorry, I hope that answered your question. Um, um, I'm kind of, I'm, Rachel, I appreciate doing it. What Rachel's one of our teammates folks who along with Joseph Digby and a few others is like bringing chat questions from all these different screens and they're doing an amazing job. I'm going to pivot back and forth a little bit. Um, Anna Roden, I see something picked up. The SAAs need guidance and what are allowable expenses. Um, Judy, if I recall correctly, we do have a, a bunch of examples inside the NOFO, if I recall correctly. Correct. Okay. Um, we have, and also the SAs, they are not shy about asking, to, you know, reaching out to FEMA. They have um, assigned preparedness officers that they have relationships with. They are not shy at all to ask us um, any questions. And, I, again, I would encourage, you know, ask before you submit, you know, because we're more than happy to, to weigh in and, and uh, you know, provide guidance and advice on what may or may not be allowable costs under this program uh, before you start writing up an application for something that may not be allowable. Great. Thank you, ma'am. Um, pivoting back to Leon McBride, um, how would the water and wastewater municipality benefit from this kind of grant? Um, Leon, again, close to my heart, um, many a moon, many a pound, and many a gray hair ago. Um, I started my career at Homeland Security working for the Association of Metropolitan Water Agencies, um, helped to run the Water Information Sharing and Analysis Center, or Water ISAC. Personally, very passionate about drinking water and wastewater um, security. But, Judy, again, going back to this note, um, you're a, a, a drinking water or a wastewater utility. Uh, you know, I didn't really think about them in terms of this national priority area, but, you know, would they be eligible for funding under this sort of, um, under the HSGP? Have you guys funded, uh, have you seen funding for drinking and wastewater utilities before through an SAA under this grant? Just curious. Uh, I can't say that I have. I mean, there are you know, literally thousands of projects every year, so that doesn't right. mean it hasn't. Um, I think the municipality itself would be an el uh, eligible subrecipient. So again, it would depend on the project request and how it's written up. Okay. Thank you. Um, from Brian Russell, are there any requirements to provide disability competency training? Do you have any thoughts on that? That's a simple. I mean, that is a, no. I, I don't, there's no uh, requirements. Obviously, for any type of training that is provided, we do emphasize and encourage to, to reach out to all facets of the community, and but there is no requirement of that nature. Okay. Um, but again, Mr. Ru thank you, Geneva. Mr. Russell, I, I would say um, that obviously reaching out to the, the disability community broader, um, we have FEMA's done considerable research in this area, as of others that have shown that unfortunately in a lot of disaster planning, not all everywhere, but in many cases, um, Disaster planning does not take into account uh, folks with disabilities. So I think if you look at this priority area, then there's a way that you could leverage this funding towards helping the resilience of, the of, of folks with disabilities in your community. Uh, we would certainly love to see some recommendations in that regard come through. Um, let me see. Would the same type of trainings offered through the HSGP also be offered through the NSGP? I don't know, Jenny, I, I, 
Any thoughts on that? I mean, to me, they're two different audiences. I think that, to me, that when I think about the NSGP versus the HSGP, that's sort of my divider, but I don't know if you want to amplify that now. Right, and I mean, when you say that the same types of trainings offered, it's really the trainings that they would have to request as a project, as a grant funding. So obviously, the, the type of training that NSGP entities more focus on are kind of that, um, and it is just tied back to the community resilience preparative, kind of we do emphasize, like, you know, you are the help until the help arrives, you know, stop the bleed, those types of things. Um, really more focused on um, how do you, you know, kind of the, what's the, the try, I'm trying to think of, you know, if a situation occurs, what are you, the response and, you know, protocols and evacuations. I couldn't think of the word evacuation, sorry. Um, but, you know, things of that nature. It's much more focused for NSGP on, what happens if there is an attack or, you know, things of that nature. Um, for HSGP, it, it's certainly more broad um, in terms of training because you can have basic security awareness training for communities. You can have, um, you know, training specific to law enforcement um, for their specific roles in the community and things of that nature. Um, so uh, that, I don't know if that answered your question, but that, those are my thoughts. Great. Thank you, Jenny. Um, Linda Leatherman, great question. Um, does identifying targets in under-resourced areas of minority populations with big box stars of high traffic increase the possibility of funding? Um, let me talk about this one a little bit holistically, Jenny, then I'm going to hand it back to you for, for sort of, you know, the, more of the sort of statutory policy level answer. So, Linda, what I would say, you've identified a couple of, of sweet spots there in your question. I, I think first and foremost, looking at the CDC Social Vulnerability Index, or SVI, data set is a wonderful and useful way to identify areas which are, or which are particularly in need of resources. I think that's number one, and that's something that we at FEMA look at as sort of the lodestar for helping us identify historically underserved communities. Um, so we would, at least from a programmatic standpoint, we would definitely encourage all of you wholeheartedly to look at that data, examine where not only you have historically underserved communities where you have high areas of traffic, and use that as data to help drive some of your recommendations um, in terms of where to necessarily, I would say, target these funds. So from a programmatic perspective, Jenny, like, you know, this, is, this is kind of music to my ears, but from sort of a grants management, sort of thumbs up, thumbs down perspective, um, any additional thoughts? Uh, for the State Homeland Security Program and Urban Area Security Initiative, uh, for better or for worse, it's really the state administrative agency that makes the decision about what projects to put forward or whatnot. And so, you know, we as FEMA, we don't, um, like I said, they already know their allocations up front, and they identify which projects to put forward for funding. So from a FEMA perspective for this program, we actually do not look at that. The states themselves might look at that in determining where they want to apply funding to, but for these pro for the state homeland security program and urban area security initiative, that's not a consideration, um, and we don't dictate to the state administrative agency how or where to, to allocate that funding, except that they have to pass through, like I said, at least 80% of the funding to local units. Okay, but Jay, no problem with me, I guess, encouraging folks to use that. Well, data. Absolutely not. Right. No. Okay. Absolutely. Right. Yeah. Okay. No problem at all. Gotcha. No. And we actually we gotcha. do use that data uh, for the nonprofit security grant program. We will be using that data this year. As for um, applicants uh, in the NSGP who are in areas that are rated as either high or very high for the CDC Social Vulnerability Index, will get um, a bump up in their scoring. But again, it's a competitive process, competitive uh, grant program, different eligible applicants, you know, kind of different purposes. But to your point, no, we, we do recognize and use the, the CDC's SBI tool for other grant programs. Okay, great. Um, Thank you, ma'am. All right, question from Michael Magnifico. Magnifico, are Tier 1 hospitals able to apply for the grant, and if so, would they need to apply through the county or do so themselves? So I think, again, Jenny, I'm, I'm trying to echo you here. Um, call the SAA, call the SAA seems to be my, my response if you weren't on the phone, but if you want to, or reach out to your local emergency manager, but I would say talk to the SAA. Would that be a fair response? Yeah, I think for this case, the, the first uh, line I would say is yeah, go go talk to the county and, and see what if their relationship, if they have it or not, with the SAA and work through them if they do, and if not, certainly reach out to the SAA then directly and, and establish that themselves. But, you know, if there's already an established relationship you can build off of, you know, that's even better. Great. Okay. Um, question from Brian Mott.
hires. Brian, great question. Really good question. Thanks, man. Um, can we hire new staff members to perform various community preparedness programs to schools, et cetera? They need to be contractors. So great question, Jenny. Using this funding to reimburse for full-time staff. Uh, thoughts on that one? Uh, I, my initial reaction to that is no, we need to be contractors. Um, because there is a, also a concern with this kind of then the continuation of the, the funding. I don't have to, right. to get again familiar because what I said there is, you know, organizational costs are allowable and there are um, staff and salary costs. That's more in like, you know, management and administration of the grant. We also pay for overtime for folks to attend training, you know, things of that nature. But for purely new positions, new salaries, uh, yeah, that's a likely a no. Okay. Yeah, Brian, I, I would say from our perspective, you know, I, um, as a career civil servant, as a federal employee, I'm not going to provide, we're not going to provide, you know, recommendations or endorsements of any particular company or contracting group, whatever that might be. But I would say um, that, that most of the major Homeland Security contractors and even some of the smaller ones do have experience teaching a lot of these courses. Um, so just as an FYR, if you were at least handling and teaching and administrating a lot of the recommendations, which I went through, recommended projects and programs that I went through at the beginning of my slideshow. Um, so question from Ilya Sulima. Is there a specific format recommended in the submission process? Uh, Jenny might think since that the NOFO is pretty it gives pretty good information about how to how to handle the step by step submission process, correct? Uh, correct. I mean that submission process is again for the SAA as the applicant. So each SAA may have different requirements, different forms, different ways that they would want um, you know, sub-applicants or entities to apply through them. Um, so while we, FEMA, have you know, required forms for the SAA as the applicant, the SAA might have additional requirements for their, for their subs. And so it seems to be a common thing. Reach out to the SAA and ask them what their requirements are, because that's going to dictate um, what you as an eligible sub-applicant, sub-entity would submit up to them, and then they submit to us. Okay, great. Okay. So, folks, I'm going to take two more questions that we're going to transition to closing remarks. Don't worry. If you haven't had your question answered, I'm going to tell you exactly what to do to get it answered. Um, so really quick. Question from Mike Stoll. Would training businesses on until help arrives and active shooter training qualify as terrorist security? So I think what they're asking here, Jenny, if we put this into NOFO, that you know, both I don't, until help arrives, and I would say for active shooter as well, those were recommended projects that could be funded under this national priority area. Um, so again, that's in the NOFO. So we do see that as projects with a linkage to terrorism. So within the NOFO, Jenny, I, I assume you would concur. I would, but what get, what trips me up a little bit on this one is training businesses. And so, like I said, these grants are for state local units of government. So for a private business, it would be a little harder to, to make that leap unless it's some, um, you know, you know, local unit of government that's training those businesses, or maybe it's the police department that's training those businesses, and the money would go to the police department to do the, to conduct the training. But we could not reimburse the private business for any of their expenses through these programs. Okay. So, Jenny, thank you for, thank you for that. So moral of the story is the Recommended programs are obviously kosher, um, but we're not going to be re directly reimbursing a business or a contractor. But if, let's say, a local emergency management agency got with their state AAA and said, hey, we're going to host You Are the Help Until the Help Arrives or at Active Shooter Training, we're going to bring in you know, trainers for a two- to three-day course, and we're going to invite all of the small businesses in that municipality, that's kind of more of the direction we'd be looking to go with this, correct? Yes. Okay, great. Thank you. Okay. All right, ladies and gentlemen, so we're going to wrap things up. So a couple of quick things. If we have not answered your question, we tried our best to get to everything, um, you can email questions about the webinar or any questions to FEMA-prepare at FEMA.dhs.gov. So please send your questions in there if we haven't gotten it answered. Um, number two, um, we would encourage you to also answer our polling questions once this wraps up to help us improve our webinars. Um, you all were the first out of the gate, our, our, our wonderful East Coasters, um, because this is the first in a series of three webinars that Ginny and I are going to be doing 
over the next couple of days. Uh, so we appreciate it. But again, we're always looking to improve these. There is a pretty, there's a, a, several of our team members spent a lot of weeks making sure these go smoothly. Um, and we want to make sure that we're giving you the information that you need. And I would, excuse me, I would make one correction. So for the technical questions on the HSGP, that should go to the GPD inbox from the email. And we will email them after this webinar. Okay. All right, folks, that's all about it. Ginny, do you have any closing remarks? I just want to say thank you, everybody. These were some fantastic questions. Um, and like Aaron said, you know, this was the first of three. There's also, you know, even though this is just focused on the community preparedness and resilience, like I said, there are still three um, additional webinars that FEMA is hosting H for HSGP-wide. And so if you have think of anything else, have additional questions, you can jump on any of the calls as well and ask us. You'll have a captive audience. I'll make sure Aaron is invited to those as well, so he can he can weigh in as well. Um, but like I said, those were on the, the one of the sides of the the presentation. Those are all Zoom calls. Um, and if you weren't able to get that again, if you email the GPD inbox, it's askcsid at fema.dhs.gov. We'll make sure that we get you all that information um, in an email as well. Great, thanks, Jenny. I'll repeat it one last time, folks. Ask. Charlie, Sam, Indigo, Delta, ask CSID at FEMA.dhs.gov. Great to speak with you all today. Also want to give a shout out to our ASL interpreter for doing a wonderful job, as always, making sure that we are communicating to those um, with that need. So folks, have a great afternoon, and uh, you're welcome to join us for the next two webinars if you'd like, and all the follow-up ones that Ginny mentioned. And we're going to be signing off. And thank you to the team.